Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for, for coming. Uh, as you know, we have a very, very special guest uh, teaching this course, this uh, lecture, as well as the one on Thursday. Uh, the one on Thursday is on the theater just above this one, so it's Theater B. Um, I don't think Martin needs any introduction. As you know, um, probably this is the re he is the reason the school is here. Probably this is the reason you're here. Uh, he's an author of six books, 23 chapters, innumerable papers. So um, I just uh, would like you to welcome and enjoy the lecture. Well, it's all yours, so. I've got an hour, have I? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Where's my talk? Just there. Yes. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, the evolution of high efficiency uh, silicon solar cell design, which the group here at the university has had quite a bit to do with. Um, I'm now uh, director of the Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics, which is a new centre that started at the university here on the 1st of February, but looking at sort of over the horizon um, photovoltaic uh, devices and so on. So this is, of course, a standard uh, silicon module, which um, this was taken, that was taken quite a few years ago, but most of the present modules have retained that original, the same sort of uh, design as over the last 20 odd years, as we'll get on to a bit more next lecture. But uh, this is what I wanted to cover today. So just uh, start off talking about recent developments and then getting more and more into um, the nitty gritty of um, how cells are designed. So I'd just sort of like to start off by talking about what's been happening recently in photovoltaics. So I'd just like to update every year what's been going on. But this shows the new um, electricity generation capacity installed worldwide in gigawatts, so 45 gigawatts. One gigawatt is a large coal or nuclear power station. Uh, so that shows about 45 large power stations installed each year. And this shows the history over the last seven years or so. And you'll see photovoltaics seven years ago was pretty small, but all of a sudden it's come from nowhere and it's one of the larger of the new low carbon energy options that are being installed. So um, rap very rapidly developed over that period. Looks like it's stabilising to some extent now the way wind did a few years earlier in terms of the amount being stored each year. But way ahead of nuclear and even ahead of gas turbines, which is the other low carbon option that's being talked about. So where might it be going? And this is a slide that people in photovoltaics often use, but it just shows world primary energy use. This was a study conducted by the German Advisory Council on Global Change, published about 10 years ago now, but this was just, you know, looking at all future scenarios um, for mitigating, uh, you know, carbon accumulation in the atmosphere, you know, which ones were the most sensible? And they came to the conclusion that the only resource that was available on large enough scale to sustainably supply the energy the world was going to need in the future was going to be solar energy. So they projected a scenario where the world made a transition from heavy dependence on these grey and black and other colours here, which are the gas or coal and oil, the fossil fuels that we depend on so heavily now, to a transition where we depend on something more sustainable. Um, so this is the solar portion here. So by mid-century, solar in this scenario is providing a substantial amount of the primary energy this is, not just electricity and uh, by the end of the century, it's providing a substantial fraction of the total power. You'll see on this graph, solar doesn't make much of an appearance until about 2030 in terms of even being able to see on this line, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. Um, but this is um, you know, the most optimistic scenario that has any credibility that's project been projected for how we might um, use solar in the future. I think the main um, challenge in beating a scenario like this is actually storage now. So it looks like the solar cells can be made cheap enough and everything and in sufficient quantity for this scenario to be met. But how do we store the energy is one of the key issues that remains to be solved. Won't talk about that in this lecture though. Um, so looking at the same type of information, but this is a logarithmic graph here showing the uh, accumulated installed capacity of different technologies over the time frame. The red lines show the projections in that chart. So this is what, you know, to fill out that yellow proportion whereby 2050 you're supplying 25% of the world's energy with 
solar electricity, this is the rate that you'd have to grow from the period where this study originated around 2000. This is the rate that was projected for the growth of the industry. A similar type of projection for wind as well. So this study tried to take into account practical constraints on a whole range of issues, including how fast an industry could grow from scratch. So they reckoned a, a new industry couldn't grow more than 10 times a decade in size. It would just be possible to sustain that rate of growth over a prolonged period. So that's pretty much what happened with wind. Wind has been growing at 10 times a decade now for the last decade or more. Um, but photovoltaics has sort of got ahead of the plot. It's been growing very much faster than that 10 times per decade to the stage that it's now five or six years ahead of this projection. So if it stays this side of the red line, you know, we're well on a trajectory to meet this future scenario where you provide 25% of the world primary energy. So we're off to a very good start with the technology, I guess you'd have to say, based on that. Um, from that past, fast, oh, I won't bother about going back, but from that past slide, um, there was over 100 gigawatts of photovoltaic installed worldwide now, like the equivalent of a 100 large coal plant or whatever. Um, but about a third of that installed capacity is in Germany. So Germany has had very effective programs for promoting the development of wind and photovoltaics and neither industry would be where they are now were it not for the success of that German program. But about a third of the world's capacity of photovoltaics is installed in Germany. So much so now it's starting to provide a substantial contribution to the electricity supply within Germany. But this shows the situation last May, which happens to be a good month for solar, like in, in Germany in winter, the, you know, you get very low output from solar systems, you know, unlike Australia where you get fairly, you know, relatively even output over the year. In Germany you get this um, build up from the winter months to the, to the summer months. But this is May, which is about, you know, along the trajectory towards the peak in summer in solar input. What's shown here is each day of May, and this shows the electricity demand upon the German grid. So 60 gigawatts is a peak value there. So the output of about 60 large power stations is the maximum demand in Germany. Australia has about half that demand. Um, so uh, you can see the electricity demand varies throughout the day, but uh, in Germany, as along with many other places, uh, the peak demand for electricity happens to be in the daytime. At night time, the demand drops right down. In fact, in places like Australia, we've tried to fill in the nighttime load by giving cheap electricity to aluminium smelters and so on to try and increase the demand at night time. So the demand for nighttime electricity is probably artificially inflated in most countries through strategies like that to try and even out the demand. Um, but you can see the solar is just about ideally matched to the demand within Germany. So this wasn't a, a completely sunny month, there were rainy days and everything, but averaged over the whole countryside, you tended to get a fairly uniform and even output of the solar both in time and um, from data, both on time scale of minutes to the time scales of days or weeks. Um, the yellow shows the solar contribution, the green shows the contribution from wind. There was about the same amount of wind and solar installed in Germany at the time. Um, this was um, you know, in May last year. Um, but what's happened is the, the grey is what has to be supplied by conventional power plants. And in the past, the power plants would have had to try and match this sort of peaky demand. And um, conventional power plants aren't too good at doing that and it makes expensive very, makes electricity very expensive during these periods of peaky demand during the daytime. Um, but you can see what's happened with the solar is it's chopped off, lopped off the top of the conventional power plant demand, sort of making it flatter, more even throughout the day. So having all this solar in Germany has actually lowered the cost of electricity generation from the conventional generators because they no longer have to try and follow this load that they're not well suited to following. Um, this is the day of peak demand for electricity within Germany and it also happened to be the day where you got the most solar and right at the time of peak demand, the middle of the day, 30% of the electricity in Germany was supplied by solar systems, small systems generally distributed around the countryside. Um, on the following Saturday here, when the demand was less, it was even higher. 40 or 50 percent of the electricity was provided by solar during the period of the peak. So already having quite a large impact upon the, um, the German power system. 
Germany's fortunate it has many countries around it that it's connected to electrically so that it doesn't really need to provide storage for the solar within the country at the moment and with the present penetration levels it can just export the excess whenever it's generating it or in periods where it needs more it, um, it can import the electricity. But you can see um, you know, the solar is ideally matched demand. Wind is a bit less well matched. You can see like days like this over the weekend, you're getting a lot of wind generated, but there's not really a demand for it, whereas the solar always occurs when there's fairly strong demand during the daytime. So that's the situation in Germany, but I think that's the way many grids around the world will be you know, in the next five or 10 years. You'll see many grids generating that high percentage of their power supply from electricity It'll, it'll initially lower the cost of electricity from conventional generators because it'll take away the peaks. And that's happening here in Australia already with a large number of residential PV systems we have. And um, uh, you know, eventually you'll have to deal with the issue of how do you store the electricity um, when periods when, you don't, when it's generating more than you need or less than you need. Just going back to the very early history of photovoltaics, this is the be very beginning. This is Edmund Becquerel who in 1839 is credited with um, making the first solar cell. It wasn't really a solar cell as we imagine it, but he had these solutions with uh, electrodes placed in them. And when he shone light onto that um, combination, he got uh, electrical current flowing within the terminals of this structure. Um, so, you know, perhaps not a solar cell, but at least it sort of demonstrated the idea that you could convert light into electricity. And he actually made a little machine from this that he used to use in his experiments to measure light intensity. So it had a practical outcome. Um, and there's still work on photoelectrochemical cells that look very much like this. So that was the very beginning, 1839. Edmund was only 19 when he, when he um, did this work. So he's tinkering around. He, he came from a long line of famous, uh, a famous family in physics. And uh, tinkering in his dad's lab, he uh, came across this effect. The first demonstration in a solid state system was made by Adams and Day in 1876. So they, they had this little um, crystal of selenium and they were measuring its electrical conductivity when they shone light on it. So selenium's a photoconductor, so it's still used, I think, even today in photoconductive applications, used in photocopies and everything until fairly recently. Um, but what they found is um, when they took the um, voltage source away from these electrodes and just shone the light on the device, they found it was generating a voltage. So that was a bit different from what they were expecting. So they, somehow the light was being converted again into electricity. So um, you know, interestingly, the physics just wasn't up to, uh, you know, to um, understanding the effect. So their best explanation of what was happening was the light was somehow crystallizing the selenium that was then causing an electrical change in it that was then generating the voltage. So you need to have the understanding of the theory to be able to appreciate some of these effects. So it was hard to develop that idea much further um, you know, without understanding the underlying physics. However, selenium formed the basis for solar cells on quite, until quite recently because it had a response very similar to the, to the eye. So you know, right through until the 60s, uh, selenium was used as photo detectors because of its similarity to the eye and its response. This was... Um, uh, Fritz's work in 1883, so he sort of took it one step closer to a modern solar cell in that he squished his selenium out onto a, what was it, I think it was a brass plate, a metal plate, squished it out and then put a thin silver leaf, a thin gold leaf on the top, the, uh, thin enough that the gold was transparent. If you beat a sheet of glass, a sheet of gold long enough, you can get it transparent. So these were quite big devices, you know, like... Um, centimetres across, but shining light onto this, he was able to demonstrate photovoltaic effect on a, you know, we're using essentially a thin film solar cell. And um, he had the vision, he saw it all at once, what was going to happen in the future. You know, he said, if the current, if not immediately, can either be stored when produced in storage battery or transmitted to a distance and there be used or stored. And remember, this is 1876, so, you know, the idea of transmitting electricity was fairly new. Then it um, you know, wasn't until the uh, 20th century that uh, electricity distribution became quite common. Uh, then um, started, uh, people discovered the photovoltaic effect in uh, cuprous oxide. So you take a sheet of copper and you oxidize it and uh, then press 
a metal contact to it and that forms one contact and this to the other. And that formed a cuprous oxide photovoltaic cell which became the, the favoured type of photovoltaic devices up until the 1930s or even later. Um, and the, at this time the, the understanding of what was happening in the devices started improving as well. You know, I've, I've heard the phrase, um, you can produce a photovoltaic device by spitting on a penny. A penny is sort of like a copper coin and I think it probably originated from this. In fact, um, several years ago I set this as a student project. Uh, someone took a sheet of copper and then tried to make a, a decent solar cell from it and with a blowtorch you can grow the right type of oxide and you can make very simple devices that don't work all that great but at least you get a photovoltaic effect. This is something always worth remembering. It's easy to get a photovoltaic effect. Spitting on a penny will get it, but getting efficient photovoltaic device is where the challenge lies. So ma many of the papers that you see in the prestigious journals like Nature and so on are what I call spitting on penny type papers. You get photovoltaic effect from unusual combinations of materials, but the chances of them producing something that compete with a, a traditional silicon device are fairly remote. Um, so this structure was refined and different materials, tellium sulphide, selenium, cuprous oxide were, were common. At this stage the theory started um, developing. There was a paper by um, Alan Wilson, a um, British um, physicist in 1930 and he was the first to develop the theory of semiconductors, the idea of conduction and valence bands and periodic potentials and so on in the, in the crystal. So he developed essentially the modern theory of um, semiconductors. If you read his paper from 1930, you know, it sounds, sounds like you're reading a, you know, a traditional physics um, textbook about the properties of semiconductors. So by 1930, the underlying theory of how the bulk material behaved and what produced a semiconductor starting to be well understood. And then people started looking more at the device aspects. And this is uh, Walter Schottke. You might have heard of Schottky diodes, his name's been immortalised within that device structure. But a Schottky diode is a contact between a metal and a semiconductor. So um, people had various theories about what was happening when you put a metal to a semiconductor, you tended to get a, a diode, a, a rectifying type of characteristic, and people had all kinds of theories. But Schottky was the first to really produce a modern understanding of that, so he believed there was something happening at the interface between the metal and the semiconductor and that was the important part of the structure. So he introduced the idea of a depletion region at the metal to semiconductor interface and um, sort of was able to deduce that you'd get rectifying properties because of the asymmetrical charge transport across that depletion region. One direction would become larger and more difficult for carriers to get across, other region, other bias direction becomes smaller and more conductive. This, case, this uh, led to the first PN junction, so the theory had been developed and this idea of an interface between dissimilar material as the cause of um, the rectifying properties of uh, these materials had, had been established by Schottky. Um, this guy, uh, Russell Ohl, in 1941 was trying to develop some very pure silicon that were being used in microwave detectors which were very important around that era, but you essentially pressed a metal whisker, a sharp metal tip against a crystal of silicon, you've got this rectifier that could work at microwave frequencies which was um, important in the radar and so on of that era. But when he was making some of his silicon, he, he used the purest material he could obtain but he, he just sort of melted in a crucible and then solidified it which is very similar to the process that is used for the majority of solar cells nowadays. But um, because his silicon wasn't all that pure, he, when he solidified he, he had um, material which had, had different properties in the first regions to solidify compared to the last regions to solidify and um, sort of this interface became quite jagged at the, well, you know, where the two regions transitioned from one to the other. And when he shone light on it, he noticed that one region became positive with respect to the rest. So he called that the P-type region. So that's very, made it very easy to remember, you know, when you've got a solar cell, which region becomes positive when you shone light on it. It's the P-type region because Russell Lowell called it the P-type region because it did become positive. And the N-type region becomes more negative. So this was the first PN junction um, made serendipitously during the um, solidification of this melt. What happens is that some of the impurities stay in the molten silicon longer. So as you 
solidify this from the bottom, the p-type impurities um, precipitate out into the solidifying silicon first, leaving the n-type impurities to solidify out later. Well, I think I've got that back to front. It's actually the other way around. N-type zone uh, looks like it's precipita precipitating first there. Um, so immediately people were trying to understand you know, what they'd seen. And they were getting very good voltages when they shone light on this, as you'll see. Um, people are understanding and they thought, oh, well, Schottky's interfacial theory, there's some type of barrier at the junction between the NP-type materials. So that was the you know, basic understanding, one idea built upon the other to lead to the understanding of what was happening here. So um, taking this material, you can make solar cells either way. You could cut little slithers like this, or, or as, as shown here. So they actually cut material out from this interfacial region and made contacts to the P and the N type side and made the first P N junction solar cells. And this is actually the, the characteristics, the current, the voltage, the resistance, and I think I got everything, current voltage resistance as you vary the intensity of the light shining on the device. So the current was more or less linearly uh, increasing with the um, light, which is what happens with normal solar cells. And the voltage shows this logarithmic increase. So they were getting voltages of about 0.3 to 0.4 of a volt out of these very crude serendipitous junctions. So um, from that you can estimate what their performance would be, but less than 1%. Um, this uh, discovery of the PN junction uh, led within 10 years to uh, William Shockley uh, developing the corresponding theory and develop inventing the NPN PN junction transistor, which was um, you know, one of the big steps forward in the development of semiconductor devices. But it all began from this simple experiment. So Russell Old didn't stop there. He said there must be a better way of making this junction. So he took some material that um, didn't have the junctions in it, that was all P-type, and then he blasted the surface with helium ions and you know, try and get a junction in a defined area and um, created a a PN created a rectifying device that way that also showed photovoltaic effect, about 1% efficient. Um, so people still make solar cells by implanting dopants within to the surface, so it was a technique that, that lives on. The first really modern cell, well, first really efficient cell was made a few years later. I guess the discovery of the PN junction and then of the transistor and so on led to enormous um, effort in developing the semiconductors and their technology and the first efficient solar cell was a result of that huge effort. So um, in 19, late 1953 um, these guys here, Pearson, Chapin and Fuller, developed the first really efficient cell. So their first devices were about 4% efficient and then they got it up to 6%. But this was their structure. They took a um, n-type um, wafer of silicon. You can see some of the wafers lying around there, half wafers, and then they um, diffused a P-type impurity into there. They tried different impurities, but um, you know, I think boron, boron was the, the last one they tried and the best. And then they made um, contact, both contacts on the rear, interestingly, to the device structure to both the N and the P-type region. These devices were initially 4%, but got up to about 6% efficient. And you can see some of them here, these little half um, wafer slithers there uh, are the actual cells. Um, everyone got quite excited by this. It actually made the front page news in the New York uh, Times. So vast power of the sun is tapped by a battery using sand ingredient. So everyone got very excited about the potential of this technology. So nuclear power was just sort of starting to become popular then and this, this was seen as an alternative to nuclear ability to tap into the sunlight. And this was a graphic that was prepared of the family looking on as the solar cells quietly generated their electricity um, from the cells. But um, silicon was very rare material in those days, very expensive to make, and the technology wasn't all that um, well developed. So the cells were very expensive, and um, this type of terrestrial application didn't happen immediately. Um, but there was an application that was found. The same time was the beginning of the space race and people were very interested in satellites and ways of generating power within space. And um, these cells um, seemed like they might be ideal for that application. They didn't um, 
you know, they could last forever in principle, they generate power. So this is a char chart showing the evolution of the efficiency. So the first device in 1941 by Russell Hole, and then in 51 he got the efficiency up to about 1%, less than that before then. And then um, at Bell Labs, using the structure I showed before with the rear contacts, they quickly got it up to 4%, 5%, 6%. I think they got up to about 8% with that type of structure. And then um, uh, someone realised that having the contacts on the front would make things a bit easier. So they started to do these um, um, double-sided <laughs> contact devices, bifacially contact devices, and that looks pretty much like a, a modern solar cell. So by the end of the 50s, uh, cells were made like this, and then there was a, um, you know, a program to develop, to make enough of them to use them on spacecraft in usable quantities. Um, so what was developed was then something called the conventional space cell, because it was to be the conventional way solar cells were made for more than a decade. But it looked like this. It was two centimetres by two centimetres. And um, some of the first were used in Vanguard 1, which was the first satellite to use them. Went up in 1958. And um, it had a few watts of these panels, you can see, on its surface. So it turned out to be a bit of embarrassment, actually. The cells lasted a bit too long. So this, this thing was uh, equipped with a radio transmitter just so people could help locate it. And the solar cells kept on working for years and years and years. And the thing kept on beeping, sort of clogging up the radio space. Um, you know, until the cells eventually conked out. In space, there's damaging radiation that um, damages the properties of silicon, so any cell in space only has a finite uh, life, which is about 10 years for a silicon cell. Uh, but this was the design that evolved, so with um, using boron-doped silicon as the wafer on which the device is made, and then diffusing phosphorus into the top surface. Um, and then these metal contacts were made if you um, make what's called a shadow mask, you have a, you know, a sheet of metal or something and you cut little slots in it, you can deposit the metal so that it's already patterned when it lands. The, 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 you know, if you have a, um, a bit of metal here that's shading the deposition, you can get defined finger structures. So it used that shadow mask technique to make the fingers. So a fairly crude technique, but you, know, you can make reasonable solar cells using it. And then uh, anti-reflection coatings um, used on the cell surface, generally silicon monoxide um, used as the anti-reflection coating. So that became the standard cell design. It was just um, in space, you have to be very conservative. You can't run the risk of trying anything too adventurous. Otherwise, you run the risk of um, you know, wrecking this multi-million dollar mission for the sake of a, a small change that may not have really been needed. So the, the design was very, you know, very conservative evolution of the technology because of the, you know, the, the application on which the cells were used. So these, the design didn't really evolve too much at all over a period of a decade as this was the um, main application. So what I'd like to do now is change tack a little bit and talk a little bit about the theory of the device. So just um, highlight the key things that I think are important about the operation of a PN junction and, and you know, the key things that make a solar cell, PN junction solar cell work. And this theory was developed by William Shockley in the late 1940s and um, you know, as a result of um, this work and the invention of the transistor and everything, he was awarded a Nobel Prize in 1956, I think. Uh, but developing this theory, and again, if you look at his original papers on this, it's pretty much the same as looking at a conventional textbooks like my red book, it's pretty, you know, you know William Shockley had written it, it would have looked pretty much the same. Um, so I guess, um, I don't think William did not do too much on the, did not contribute too much to the theory of the solar cell, but he did to the theory of the PN junction, which is the solar cell in the dark. So the current voltage characteristics of a solar cell, you know, William could um, give essentially a modern description of, of those and, and the underlying mathematics. So um, a PN junction forms this rectifying junction, and then when you illuminate it, the, the curve moves down to this first, fourth quadrant where you can extract the useful power from the device. Um, William's contribution was to the, to the PN junction theory. So of the key points there, I think that, uh, you know, the way I like to describe it is that you're putting two dissimilar materials together. The uh, material that's P-type, um, in the p-type material, you have mainly the holes as the conductors with that material. 
So you have p-type dopants that um, release um, holes into the valence band or extract electrons from them. Um, and um, the electron concentration in that material is quite low. And then the n-type side, you have the opposite. You have electron concentration hole high and the holes in the valence band concentration low. And then this is getting back to Walter Schottke's idea. You put the two together, you're going to get some type of barrier at the interface because you've got to make a transition from this type of behaviour where one concentration is high and the other is low to the other type of concentration. So you've just got to some, somehow that it's got to transition over. And, um, you know, so the transition region was the name given to that region at the interface between the two that Walter Schottke was interested in. Um, if you then apply a voltage to the structure, and this is where Walter, this is where Walter Schott, Schockley came in, Schottke and Schockley, very similar names, um, where Walter Schockley came in and um, um, William Shockley, sorry. We got Walter Shockley and William Shockley. Um, William Shockley came in and, and this was um, his real contribution, just understanding what happened when you applied a voltage to that PN junction. But what it, what it does is that if you apply a voltage, you sort of lower the potential across that transition region and you get some of the electrons from the n-type side spilling over into this, um, this p-type region. So applying the voltage, it reduces the barrier that was sort of holding them apart, and then you get this spillover into this region, and similarly with the holes. So this is a linear plot, and I've shown a little break there because these concentrations are enormous compared to these, like millions of times higher. So um, uh, it's hard to draw them on a linear scale without having a break like that. But um, it turns out that um, electrost the electrostatics all works out if there's a corresponding change in the concentration of the majority carriers, say the electrons here, when the holes spill over, you get a corresponding change in the concentration of the carriers. So electrostatically, it's, it's neutral, the material where this change is occurring. This is the way you normally think about it. It's more of a logarithmic way that you think about it. The relative change in the concentration is very small here. So if you plot it on a logarithmic scale, you can hardly see the change here, whereas you can have quite enormous changes here. So this is the way that um, you know is important in thinking about how the device works. Uh, the changes in the minority carriers, although they're only the same as the changes in the majority carriers, they're the important changes that occur. Um, so this was, um, you know, William Shockley spent a few years working all this out and came to the essentially modern realization of that. So by changing the voltage across the device, you can change this amount of spillover. So you can sort of dial up a a value of the concentration at the edge of this region by controlling the voltage across the device. So um, it turns out that this um, gradient of the carriers here corresponds to a, a current flow of them. The carriers can, um, you know, the carriers will naturally tend to go flow from regions of high concentration to low. So you've got holes flowing in this direction, electrons flowing in that direction because of those gradients. And because they carry opposite charges, uh, results in a current in the same direction. So a current in this direction with electrons flowing in that direction. Um, so by um, dialing up this voltage here, you can control the magnitude of that, that, that flow. So the, um, the exponential dependence of this concentration upon the voltage is what gives you the um, rectifying characteristics of the, of the device. Um, so within the device, the other important thing is the surface region. So um, again, Schottky was well aware of this and the effects of this surface region. This is the situation where this sort of goes on forever. You get this exponentially decay down to the original equilibrium value. But once you have surface recombination, you can, if a surface was here, for example, you'd interrupt that decay depending upon the surface properties. So the surface recombination velocity is the way this is uh, taken into account. Um, when you shine light on the device, uh, it's easiest to think about it if you have the device short-circuited. So if you have um, zero voltage across the device, you can, con as I said, the voltage controls this concentration here. So um, you, know, you can just sort of dial up a knob. How many carriers do you want at the edge here? So if you have the device short-circuited, no voltage, 
it turns out that you, you get the equilibrium concentration here. So you have the equilibrium concentration here. The light is getting absorbed in the semiconductor, creating carriers within these bulk regions here. So you've got zero concentration here, um, ca excess carriers being generated by the light in this region here. So what's going to happen? You're going to get a diffusive flow of carriers into the junction. So you know this is essentially a sink for carriers. So all the carriers that are in the vicinity will flow into that junction. And you'll notice the gradient is opposite that of the diode in forward bias. So you're getting under light illumination, getting a current in the opposite direction to the to the forward fl current flow in the device structure. So that gives you this type of curve. Um, ideally, you just superimpose that current upon the, the uh, current in the dark. This is the current flowing in the opposite direction on short circuit. You get this superposition and the usual type of solar cell device characteristic. Simple. And uh, everything else is just an embellishment of that. Uh, so this, this idea of superposition is very important. You just take the dark characteristics, superimpose the current you get at short circuit, and you end up with the final device characteristics. There are well-known situations where the superposition doesn't occur, but it's a good starting point in looking at what's happening in the device structure. I'll just finish the lecture, and then I'll take any questions if there are any. Um, I hope there are. Um, talking a little bit about how cells evolved, design evolved there, which is until the modern era. I call the beginning of the modern era is when the group here started to get involved in photovoltaics. So um, looking at what happened between the use of cells in spacecraft till the group was formed here. So as I said before, um, you know, these type of conventional space cells, you know, these are, you know, these little two centimetre by two centimetre, one stacked one on top of the other. And they, you know, any satellites got bigger and bigger, but the cells stayed pretty much the same. So the satellite technology evolved rapidly, the cell design didn't. So you have this period, um, you know, this design was perfected around this period here and got to about 14% efficiency with these cells. And then there was this decade from the 60s to the 70s where the device stabilised because people were making these very expensive satellites and didn't want to try anything tricky with the cells and in case something went wrong and um, the whole mission was, um, was wasted because of the, um, the failure of the cells. Um, but then uh, people in the 1970s, there was a you know, big evolution of um, microelectronics over this period. So the 70s was where microelectronics really started taking off. So in the 60s, people had, well, the 50s, people had been making transistors, uh, you know, different from the radio valves that had dominated electronics before then. In the 60s, people started making integrated circuits. Um, so my first job was in 69. It was a company making integrated circuits here in Sydney. And, uh, you know, we had nine transistors on the, on the chip. So that was um, pushing the technology to the limits then. But by the 70s, people were starting to get up into really useful numbers of transistors and the technology was becoming quite sophisticated. And at that time, um, a group looked at this design and said, you know, what can we do to improve it? And um, it turned out to, you know, to enable you to make a good, reliable contact to the solar cells, this phosphorus diffusion into the cell had been quite heavy. So there was a standard amount of phosphorus that was diffused into the surface because you know everyone knew that worked and gave good performance and so on. And the anti-reflection coating was on the cell wasn't all that good anyhow. So that um, it, it turned out that it didn't wasn't important whether you had um, a lot of phosphorus in the device or not. So if you plot this is a logarithmic plot of the ph phosphorus concentration versus depth or or the effective ph phosphorus concentration. So you can measure the electrically active phosphorus in the material. So it turned out it didn't matter how much you stuck into the material, you've got a limit to how much was electrically uh, active. So a lot of the phosphorus was there was in an inactive state. So it could be precipitated out as a compound. Silicon phosphide is a compound that, that forms if you have too much phosphorus in the material. There was a limit to the amount of phosphorus that um, could be electrically active in the silicon. It's related to the solid solubility of the phosphorus in silicon. So somewhere um, you know, into the 10 to the 20, about 3 by 10 to the 20 is the limit to the, doesn't matter how much phosphorus you stick in there, you'll only end up with that amount electrically active. 
So this was sort of the, the standard diffusion used in the conventional cells, quite a heavy diffusion, but a lot of the phosphorus in the surface region was electrically inactive. So it was probably there as precipitates of silicon phosphide or so on, which is not good for the material quality. So within this structure, you had what was called a dead layer along the surface. You know, this region here where you got more phosphorus than what you need. And um, it was sort of electrically dead. So the light comes into the device and you might remember that um, the absorption materials is, is strongest where the light first enters. There's sort of an exponential decay in the light intensity in a absorption in a, in a material in which it's absorbed. That's the lambert beer law, exponential decay in light intensity in an absorbing material. So all these, ex you know, any colour, there's an exponential decay with the material, but it, all, it means that you get your maximum generation of carriers right at that surface region. So in this design, you had the light being absorbed in the material. You know, you know, plenty was still getting absorbed down here, but the maximum intensity of the absorption was right at the surface where the material was not its, at its best because of all this excess phosphorus. Um, but nonetheless, you got um, good electrical contact. You know, having plenty of phosphorus made it easy to make electrical contact. The damaged material makes it easy to make electrical contact. So the, you, know, you had a nice, reliable cell design. Um, it turns out that the biggest impact is for um, high energy photons. The higher the energy of the photon, the more quickly it's absorbed in silicon at least. So if you have a UV photon, it's absorbed more quickly in silicon than a red photon. So the, the blue photons were getting absorbed close to the surface, so they the, were the ones most affected by this um, dead layer. Um, but it didn't really matter too much because the anti-reflection coating was made of silicon monoxide. It's sort of a, some type of mixture of silicon and silicon dioxide, um, you know, like a two-phase mixture of the two materials. And it absorbed a lot of the blue light anyhow, so it didn't really matter that the cell wasn't using the blue light because a lot got absorbed in the anti-reflection coating anyhow, so everyone was quite happy with the design. But by um, doing a lighter and lighter diffusion here, you can um, reduce the extent of the dead layer or even get rid of it entirely. And that led to the next big jump that you can just see the beginning of here in cell performance. Oh no, it's actually this little step here. Um, these, these the space cells were made of p-type material because the p-type material was more resistant to the damage that you get in space that I mentioned before. But the best cells had been made with n-type material, but no one used them because the um, n-type material was less durable in space. So um, um, it turned out with, um, by paying attention to this top region, you could do better than with n-type material with the standard way that those cells were made. So this, um, cell design used a lighter diffusion, so instead of this deep one, it used a light one and removed the dead layer at the surface entirely. So light top diffusion, no dead layer. This cell was called the violet cell, incidentally, because it looked violet to the eye. Those previous space cells looked blue, you know, the blue colour that you've seen in those slides is how they actually look. And then um, if you make this less um, conducting, less phosphorus in there, it's going to be less conducting, so it turns out you need to have these fingers closer together which with this approach, the fingers were used here, it would mean you'd shade more and more of the cell. But if you use some of the photographic techniques that have been well developed in microelectronics by this stage, you can make these lines narrow and hence put them together without shading the line. So using photographic techniques to define how wide these lines are rather than the crude masking techniques that we use with these structures here means you can avoid having a, a resistive penalty associated with this lighter diffusion. And the other change that was made at about the same time was um, people realised um, that by heating aluminium on the rear, you got an improvement in the device performance. There's a few theories as to why that was happening um, you know, back in the early 70s when this was discovered. Um, but it turns out that what was happening was that at the temperatures that were involved, the aluminium was actually um, melting the silicon in the immediate vicinity and then as you cooled the cell down, recrystallising a region that was doped with aluminium. So the, this aluminium layer here was melting the silicon as you heated the device structure in this very thin layer here. And then when you, you know, so that layer was a molten mixture of aluminium and silicon. And then when you re-solidified, you end up with the silicon growing back onto the wafer here, but this 
ground layer doped with aluminium forming a P plus layer on the rear. So that was another important feature in the, in the device design. That's called a back surface field. Um, there is actually a field here at the interface of the P plus and the P type region. Um, but electric field effect was the way that the uh, improvement that obtained with this technique was described. And then um, the anti-reflection was designed. So um, um, silicon monoxide has a low refractive index. By bumping up the refractive index, you could get a better anti-reflection effect and also less absorbing materials were used. So a higher index, less absorbing, I should have had there as well. And then um, because the cells could respond to blue wavelengths better, it turned out that they're less susceptible to the degradation that you see in space. So you're able to change the, increase the doping in this material. It turns out the space degradation is related to the number of dopants you have in this material. But by um, making the devices more sensitive to blue light, you made them more tolerant to degradation in this material. So you could go to a higher doping of the substrate, which gives you a higher voltage output from the device. Um, so that gave a jump in performance and um, using that violet cell structure. So conceptually a big step forward, just critical look at the design that was being used and then you know, everyone has accepted as the way you made solar cells and then saying, no, you can do better. And then soon after, people discovered this uh, texturing approach. It had already been used in microelectronics, so it was applying a discovery made in, in microelectronics. These are crystalline wafers, but if you attack it with the right chemical, you can expose different crystal planes in the material. So some crystal planes, you know, because of the atomic density, etch at different rates than other crystal planes. So, you know, by picking the right etchant, you could um, end up with these, the right orientation of this substrate and the right etchant, you can end up with these little pyramidal structures on the surface that are etched out during the etching process. And they're just defined by the crystallography of the material. So, you know, very regular patterns like this. So this was called, this was called texturing. And this was the black cell. You know, you look at a cell that's well textured with a good anti-reflection coating, it looks like black velvet, virtually um, completely absorbing. And that gave a big jump in efficiency and brings us to the modern era. We started in 1974 at the university and this, that's the um, year this cell was developed. So looking at the improvements, this is the current voltage curve of those different types of cells. Um, you know, the, the fourth quadrant curve reflected about the voltage axis, which is the way the cells are normally plotted. These are contours of constant power output. So if you do those contours, they look like curves like that, easy for finding where the maximum power point is on those devices. But this was the conventional cell that dominated for a long time. The violet cell overcame a lot of the deficiencies, gave an improvement in current due to all those things I mentioned, no dead layer, better anti-reflection coating. In particular, back surface field and uh, improvement in voltage due to the heavier doping. And then the, the, the non-reflective cell, the black cell, by this texturing approaches gave you the extra boost in current, just got rid of com reflection losses completely. Not much change in voltage. So this is the response to different wavelengths of lights. This is the uh, milliamps per milliwatt of input. So this is the, you should ideally get a linear increase in the response of a perfect cell if you, you know, measure it in terms of the power input rather than the photon input. Uh, and this is wavelength here. So this was the normal cell here, and as I said, it's, it didn't respond well to the blue light. So below about 0.5 of a micron um, wavelength, just where the eye is starting to be responsive, it um, didn't respond very well. And then at the red wavelengths, you've had this, um, you didn't have this back surface field structure, so you had a fall off in the red response. Bad anti-reflection coating, so a, a lot of performance loss due to reflection, these middle wavelengths. With the uh, violet cell, you got rid of all that dead layer and the associated losses, better anti-reflection coating, and uh, a back surface field. So improvement in current output right over the spectrum zone here. And then the black cell took that to a new level where the anti-reflection coatings were starting to fall off here. You hang in there with the black cell and getting good response at those wavelengths as well. So that's it for today, anyhow. Um, we've now up to the modern era, and in the next lecture we'll carry on from there, just looking at what features are important in the design of a
high efficiency modern solar cell. But if there are any questions, I'd be only too pleased to uh, answer them. Thank you. Anyone going to kick things off? Oops, we got on to next week's lecture. <laughs> so, um, in the case of the uh, uh, texture that was done, mm -hmm. does that also uh, uh, help you in the short wavelengths or only in the, in the long wavelengths? Yeah, no, it, it's really um, quite hard to design an anti reflection coating for silicon at short wavelengths because the refractive index of silicon increases very rapidly at short wavelengths. So silicon has a direct band gap at about 3.4 electron volts, which is about 380 nanometer wavelength. So at um, wavelengths that are shorter than that, the silicon is very, um, its it index goes up very rapidly once you become energies below the um, direct band gap. And um, because the anti-reflection coating has to be matched to the index of silicon, it has to be the square root of the index of silicon and the material on the other side, um, you need a higher index to match well at those short wavelengths. And then again, it's very hard to find materials with high indexes that aren't absorbing at UV wavelengths. So it's just about impossible to design an anti-reflection coating for silicon at the short blue wavelengths, but that texturing approach works at all wavelengths. So it's sort of a wavelength neutral uh, reflection reduction technique. So you get a big uh, jump. Hopefully uh, it was, you'd see it in that, in that uh, slide I showed. Um, so you do get a big jump in the blue response of the cell. You can see it's killing the normal cell there. And then at the red end of the spectrum where the normal anti-reflection coating design is starting to conk out, it can only, uh, an anti-reflection coating made from one material can only reduce reflection to zero at one particular wavelength whereas that texturing approach reduces you know, right across the spectrum. So uh, again, at the red wavelengths, it, it um, becomes markedly superior to uh, other anti-reflection approaches at both ends of the spectrum. Um, yes. For the, the space cells that you initially showed, I think the one on the satellite, yes. um, I noticed that, uh, so you said the metal was deposited somehow onto on top of the, um, the holes in the anti-reflection from the Yes. Um, so how do they make those openings? And yeah, so, so the, um, the idea is you have a shadow mask. So you imagine my um, fingers were there and then you deposit, you evaporate the metal. So the metal comes down like a, a vapor. It can only get onto the cell in the regions where there's holes. So you have a, a mask like this. And these regions that are not covered is where the metal um, stays on the material. The rest of the metal's on my fingers. Um, and, and you just throw that out. Um, but that, uh, and then you put the anti-reflection coating on afterwards. Okay. So, so you don't have to, you know, a very simple technique. Um, you know, it's good in the research lab even today if you're just making crude solar cells. So you've got a limit on, you know, it's, it's opposite of this. It's, it's more like that. You need to have t very narrow fingers and a lot of uh, covered region. And there's a limit on how fine you can make the fingers with that approach. So that's where the limitation lies. Um, but, but, you know, some quite nice, sophisticated masks have been designed for that, that sort of shadowing deposition approach. So what sort of um, widths are you talking about? Yeah, yeah it's, um, you know, like 200 microns is a... I forget the, spa the width of the standard um, space cell, but the standard space cell always had the same number of fingers. I think it was six fingers. So that was part of the standard design as well. So the six fingers across two centimetres. I think, I think it must have been uh, two millimetres spacing between them. I'm not sure if the maths work out, but anyhow, it was, uh, it, um, it was sort of like a two millimetre spacing between the fingers, and then they were about a tenth of that, the fingers in their width, about 200 microns in their width. So that's... that's you know, you maybe you can get down to 100 microns with that technique, but, um, you know, with photolithography, you can get down to one micron or even, you know, nanometers with present technology. Yes? So, um, we have very good optics um, and with a very good, very well-designed uh, uh, 
texturing and also of the air coating and the well designed uh, rear mirror. We can do the maximum the uh, light uh, the basic light pass length is fifty times of the thickness. Mm -hmm. right? So um, can we do the uh, any like a better optics so that it can go beyond fifty? Yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about that next week, but but um, what you can do with by designing the device properly, you can make it look about optically about 50 times thicker than, than what it is. And that's one of the developments that you know is, is from the modern era. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that next week. But to answer your question, yes, you can do better than 50, but there's always a price to be paid. So you, you can do better than 50, but you have to sacrifice something. Okay, well, I think we've run out of time, so um, if there's no more questions, or if you have any questions, you know, you're welcome to um, contact me or um, ask them next week. Thank you. Thanks, sir.